object-oriented programming isn't new particularly and it isn't complicated although there's a huge number of big words involved in this area of programming. Often people use those big words in order to kind of blind other people with science. If you're writing PHP using arrays and functions, genuinely you have everything you need to be able to work with and create your own objects in PHP. As I say, it's not super new, so it's not particularly groundbreaking um, topic, but we have great support for objects in PHP now. This wasn't always true, so if you've been burned by weird object behaviour in PHP, try and forget those bad memories, because in PHP 5, particularly the newer versions, we have some very good object-oriented support, and it's a standard practice in the industry now. People come into the industry and start learning PHP all kinds of different times for different reasons and from different backgrounds. To get involved with PHP and to use OOP, Object Oriented Programming, you definitely don't need a degree in computer science. Object Oriented Programming is just about the way that we organise our code. It's about the way that we move information around inside our applications and the way that we organise the functionality that's there. The functionality that's in the objects will look a lot like the functionality that's currently in your functions, but it's really just a different way of structuring things. So many web applications will spend an awful lot longer being live, being in maintenance mode, than they do being built. Hardware is cheap and your time as a programmer is very expensive and valuable. Therefore, it's very important that we have very easily maintainable code. So, objects help us to organise our applications in a way that make it easy for developers not only to build it in the first place, to test it to ensure quality, but also to maintain that code, to make changes, fix bugs or add new features as those are required during the life cycle of the project. In your existing applications, you probably have data stored in arrays. So you'll have an array that relates to a particular thing, perhaps a product or a user. The information in that array will have keys and values, and the keys are usually what we call associative keys, so they have words associated with them. Um, the database libraries often return arrays as well, so you might be working with an array that actually represents a row in a database table. You'll also have some functions that relate to different kinds of data. So you might have functions relating to a user, how to get a particular user, get the information about a currently logged in user, allow a user to register and so on. You'll also see other similarly named functions in little clusters through your application, perhaps DB Connect, DB Query, different prefixes that are common to functions which belong together. These two ideas of arrays and functions, which relate kind of to each other and to a particular topic area, are really what we're trying to do in object-oriented programming. Here's your first big word. We encapsulate the functionality and the data together into an object. So we have an object which stores data, exactly like an array does, and we have an object which also is aware of its own functionality. So it has functions, except we call them methods, associated with it. It knows how to perform actions that relate to itself. It's much tidier than having a great many prefix function names. We also have namespaces, which is a way of separating objects um, so that they can be in a structure and can be referred to in an even more separated way. In this session, we'll just be talking about objects and classes and how we keep those things separate. So I just said this word class, and I'm talking about object-oriented object programming. And I think it's quite confusing to see what's a class and what's an object. So let me see if I can make this a little bit clearer for you. The class is, it's a, it's a blueprint. It's a recipe, some instructions on how to make something. Um, 
I'm in my kitchen, it's not kind of a, an apple crumble recipe, but that's a good example of a class. You can't eat a recipe, but with the recipe you are able to make the actual dish that's in question. The object is the actual apple crumble that we make. And they could be slightly different from each other, and you could have many objects. Um, indeed, it's funny that I picked apple crumble because I make it quite often. And sometimes it's not apple, it might be plum or pear or raspberry, whatever came to hand. Those could all use a very similar recipe or class, creating some quite different objects. Um, and that, that relationship between a class which describes something, which gives you instructions for how to make a thing, can give rise to a great many objects. They are representing something themselves, they are things, and we can pass them around inside our application. There will be many of them, all made from the instructions from the one class. So we've talked about classes, how we define our objects. We've talked about the objects that we make from those class instructions. The objects have data inside them. Rather than being array elements or variables, we call them properties. But they really just look like associative array elements in a lot of ways. And we also have methods or functions associated with the object. These are defined in the class and put into the object when we create it. Here's another big word. When we create an object, we say we instantiate the object. So, armed with all your big words and this idea, join me in the next chapter where I'll be at the computer showing you some class definitions and how to instantiate your objects from those.